Before we get started, I have a couple announcements. First, thank you to everyone who participated in our 2020 holiday giving drive. Our goal was to raise $25,000, and because of your support, we were able to do so. So thank you to everyone who gave, and uh, also thank you to everybody who is not able to give but supports the Institute in other ways. We need all of you in order to continue our work. Also, applications for the Analyst Training Program are closing on January 15th, so if you are applying to the Analyst Training Program, please make sure to get everything in by that date. Also, we have registration open for an upcoming program on February 5th. The program is Love, Eros, and Emptiness in the 21st Century, The Mandala Speaks. That's with Don Troyer, MD, and Jungian Analyst on February 5th, 2021. Oh yeah, Happy New Year, 2021. From 1 to 4 p.m. Chicago uh, Central Time. So to register for that course, just visit our website. Thanks. Welcome to the Jung Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminars from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Finding Personal Resilience in Changing Times, an interview with James Hollis. In this episode, Patricia Martin interviews James Hollis, Ph.D., about his recent book, Living Between Worlds, Finding Personal Resilience in Changing Times. James Hollis, Ph.D., was born in Springfield, Illinois, and graduated from Manchester University in 1962 and Drew University in 1967. He taught humanities 26 years in various colleges and universities before retraining as a Jungian analyst at the Jung Institute of Zurich, Switzerland. He is presently a licensed Jungian analyst in private practice in Washington, D.C. He served as executive director of the Young Educational Center in Houston, Texas for many years, was executive director of the Young Society of Washington until 2019, and now serves on the JSW Board of Directors. He is a retired senior training analyst for the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts, was first director of training of the Philadelphia Young Institute, and is vice president emeritus of the Philemon Foundation. Additionally, he is a professor of Jungian Studies for Saybrook University of San Francisco and Houston. He has written a total of 16 books which have been translated into 19 languages. He lives with his wife Jill, an artist and retired therapist in Washington, D.C. Together they have three living children and eight grandchildren. Patricia Martin is a noted cultural analyst, author, and consultant uh, whose bio I have read a couple times already, so we'll not continue to read the full bio as uh, we do more of these interviews. So if you want to learn more about her, just read the podcast description. So now here's the interview. Hello, everyone. This is Patricia Martin, and I'm a cultural analyst, a researcher, and a professional affiliate at the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Today, I'm with James Hollis who weaves social, cultural, and psychological studies into useful wisdom for everyday life. Hollis has authored more than a dozen best-selling books, and his lectures are widely available for those seeking wisdom about how to live a more meaningful life. Respected for decades-long work in the field of depth psychology, he is a practicing Jungian therapist based in Washington, D.C. And in 2020, he released a new book, Living Between Worlds, Finding Personal Resilience in Changing Times. It explores the innate resilience of the psyche during difficult times. Jim, welcome. Thank you, Patricia. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you. So you released this book, Living Between Worlds, in June of this year. 
during a pandemic. Yeah. And did you did you write it with a view toward filling the void of the pandemic or was it in your thoughts earlier? No, ironically, the book was actually finished two years earlier, but it was um, slotted into the publisher's schedule and it took him two years to get the book out. So it appeared to be driven by the uh, pandemic, but, uh, you know, change and crisis and transformation are going on with us all the time. So it's really a universal theme. But little did I know that it would surface in the middle of what we're dealing with right now. It's interesting because it does read like it's tailor-made for these times. Mm -hmm. I guess you would call that synchronicity. (laughs) I suppose so, yes. (laughs) So the book calls for people to reclaim their personal authority Mm -hmm. and their sense of identity when that might not be reflected out in the external world. And finding meaning amidst this kind of chaos, that's a pretty tall order. Um, what, What would you say... Now that it has been out since June and you've seen the pandemic unfold, Mm -hmm. um, do you change your stance at all on on how people should confirm their sense of agency and identity um, despite the crumbling of institutions that might confer that? Well, it's precisely that which throws people back upon themselves. And uh, I mentioned in the initial chapters of the book, notable occasions in history where there were crises of meaning, where the old order crumbled for one reason or another, and threw people into those in-between times. And of course, people who come into therapy are usually in in in-between times. Their previous roadmap is no longer applicable to the territory in which they find themselves. They uh, are are utilizing tools of one kind or another that don't seem to be that effective, if they ever were. So we always live in in in-between times, whether we know it or not, sometimes historically and sometimes personally. So you mentioned personal authority. I just mentioned a a word about that. We're born with it. It's called instinct. But we are also social animals. So as a result of which, we constantly have to make adaptations to the demands, expectations, and exigencies. So in in those sort of trade-offs and necessary trade-offs, we often it's separated from, you know, our core. And as a result of which, sooner or later, the autonomy of the psyche begins to throw up its own protest. And, and, and that protest is what we call symptoms. And it's symptoms that get our attention. You know, in other words, I could have done all the right things and yet find myself depressed. And you have to ask why, if I've been serving my cultural agenda so, so adequately and, and, Yet inside, it feels empty or and, and non, non-meaningful to me. So it's in those moments that people begin to question, who am I? Why am I here? In service to what? What's going on here? And that's what brings people into uh, either cultural analysis or personal analysis. Well, you, you talk about the, the psyche as being <clears throat> sort of the fundamental mm-hmm. locus of our resilience. And it's as if to say, you know, it's, it's what makes us resilient. And yet you also say that in the field of psychology and psychiatry, the psyche has sort of taken a back seat. Can mm-hmm. you talk more about that? Yes, certainly. And remember the word psyche is the literal translation or the literal translation of English would be the soul. And so we know where behaviors and behavioral modification addresses that. We know where cognitive processes and cognitive psychology addresses that. And we know we we have bodies. And so psychopharmacology addresses some of those issues. But if you put all that together, you still don't have the human being. What really makes us tick or or what governs our journey. And, And that's the soul. And the moment you use the word soul, admittedly, It stirs up all kinds of associations. So we have to sort of, if we can, scrape off those associations and just see it as our core or our essence. And the thing we don't know until life tests us sufficiently is that we're brought into this life with the skills, the characteristics, the resolve, and and the deep resources that nature gives us. 
And we may not know they're there, but just briefly, we all have a feeling function, which we've learned to override, but our feelings constantly are giving us a qualitative analysis of where we are at any given moment. We, we also have energy systems. We can mobilize our energy and service the necessary tasks. But uh, at the same time, if we keep doing that in the wrong directions, it leads, as we know, to boredom and then exhaustion and then depression and self-medication and, and so forth. We also have dreams that are constantly speaking to us about how things are going from that other perspective. And, and fourthly, we experience our lives as sustained by meaning. And when we have meaning, as you pointed out, anything is bearable. <laughs> All tasks in a certain way can be undertaken. But without it, life thickens and sours and, and we find ourselves, you know, living in some kind of psychological sterility of some sort. So this happens again uh, throughout history. But we also have to remember, we've been equipped by nature, just as our ancestors were, to, to in a sense, draw upon those inner resources. And right now in the pandemic, of course, a lot of people have found the degree to which they were depending on their friends or their familial connections or their various forms of escapism or, or the daily assignment of their work schedules. And, and when those others are not there to take us away at some level from ourselves, then again, this leads us to fall back upon ourselves. And back in the 17th century, Blaise Pascal said, our greatest difficulty rises from our inability to sit in a private chamber with ourselves. In other words, to tolerate ourselves. Now that's in the 17th century, mind you. And he mentioned that at that time, he said, even the court with all of its privilege and we could say for most people in the Western world, we live a privileged life compared to most of humanity and most of history. But he said, even the court had to invent the gesture because the gesture diverts the, the attendees of all of that privilege uh, so that they not reflect upon themselves. And it's that kind of separation that a lot of people are confronting right now throughout our country and of course other countries around the world. I find it interesting that you mention in the book, in, in a couple of places, um, the idea that in previous cultures, there has been access to the gods and the myths and archetypes that um, were shared commonly among people, fairy tales. Um, and of course, Jung is, is uh, used fairy tales as an integral part of his work. Uh, but now we don't quite have that same system. And so during these times, people are, you know, they're falling into some of the things you talked about, but adding a layer of media habituation mm -hmm. that is, um, it's taking a toll. If you were to, to assess that, what would you say it's doing to us? Well, just to follow up on your point, and it's, it's a, an important point, historically, People were sustained, given a sense of personal identity, a, a sense of locus in the cosmos by the informing myths of their time. And by myths, we mean those energy laden images that connected them to the cosmos, to nature, to each other on a tribal level and to their own um, identities. You, you sort of erode that. And what happens? You fall back upon yourself and, um, the great treatment plan that our culture has worked out for it is, uh, is popular culture whose gift is and curse is a diversion, uh, you know, to divert us from reflecting upon ourselves, as Pascal noted. And it was his word back in the 17th century, divertis small, from which we get the word diversion. And so what are we diverting from? We're diverting from an encounter with our own souls and that suggests something about the degree of self-estrangement that is furthered by those constant plug-ins that we have with the 24 uh, hours, seven days a week, um, you know, distractions of the world going on around us. And, you know, that, that leads ultimately to, you know, the pseudo religions of the modern era. Um, you know, people need to find something that gives them a sense of direction and purpose and, you know, our pseudo-religions are materialism 
uh, in the fantasy that I, I fill my emptiness or assuage my anxieties by purchases and filling my life with junk, um, with uh, hedonism, the search for pleasure, avoidance of pain, and, um, you know, narcissism. It's all about me. It's not about connection with other people. It's not about community. So uh, we, these are modern religions and a few others we could throw in, and, and they're not working so well, as we all know. So that's fascinating that you throw narcissism in there because um, I think many of your colleagues might agree that it's, um, it's somewhat of a social epidemic mm -hmm. um, psychologically. But I wonder what you would say about the amount of pressure now that lies within the individual to fill in the void for what used to exist culturally in mm -hmm. history, just as you described it. I mean, it's a big job to have to self-invent in this way, um, mm -hmm. not only to sustain yourself in your day-to-day -day life, have a relationship with your psyche and your soul, and then also mm -hmm. to kind of fill in where culture used to provide you some nourishment. So is, does that have any relationship with the rise of narcissism? Well, I think so. And really, this is a, a double issue here. First of all, Jung repeatedly noted that what it means to be modern, or in our time, postmodern, means that the um, sort of locus of meaning has shifted from those tribal mythologies and sacred institutions to the shoulders of the individual, which is certainly daunting and intimidating for many. It's also a great privilege and a great freedom, and I think a deep dignity that comes to the person. So that I'm defined by what, what is wishing expression in the world through me, as opposed to my plugging into the collective around me. The second, second issue here is there's very little in our culture that encourages people to find their own resources or even informs them that they have them. So for example, um, who takes seriously working with one's dreams? You know, that's something that's, you know, it's kind of an amusement for a few people, but very few people realize that every night autonomously, our psyche is speaking expressively about its perspective on our life. And yes, it does use a symbolic language. It doesn't clank out a telex to tell us this or that very clearly. But, um, you know, as Jung pointed out, it's up to us to begin to learn that language that arises from our own soul. We are the symbol-making animal, after all. And, um, you know, dreams uh, research studies have indicated that if you reach 80 years old, as I am right now, we will have spent six years of our life in dreams. Now, that's extraordinary. Wow. It doesn't, you know, waste activity. It's serving a purpose. You know, and part of it, I think, is the metabolizing of the magnitude of stimuli that come to us every day, which is why we have to repair from the world and, and rest up and, and so forth. It's not only the restoration of, you know, physiological tissue, it's also about the psychological tissue as well. But in addition to that is, is this autonomous mode of expression in our life. So uh, dreams alone are about one example of how we've become estranged from what our ancient ancestors would have taken very seriously. It's interesting because you also talk in the book about how depth psychology has been sort of muted um, in preference for things like behavior modifications and mm -hmm. um, coaching and it's a, it's a fix-it system mm -hmm. rather than a yeah. system of self-examination. Mm -hmm. And I'd love you to talk more about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a funny example. I was in the hospital recently, and a nurse asked me what I, was, what I did for a living, and I tried to tell her, and, and she, she said, well, how, how is your approach different from someone else? And I said, well, for example, we try to evoke a conversation with the unconscious. And she said, Oh, I get it. You work with people in a coma, right? <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh at that. And, and, uh, that was, that was saying something about the world that she lives in. And I'm not criticizing. I'm just, I just found it sort of amusing that the idea that we could have a conversation with ourselves was a very foreign idea. And, and underneath all of that really is an invitation to the therapy of meaning. In other words, I, I think, 
we all as analysts, certainly at times involved and, and employed behavioral techniques and, and cognitive restructuring techniques, but in, in the long run, this is about a conversation with your own depths. And that's not narcissism. It's quite the contrary. It's, it's, it's going to take you places that your ego probably doesn't want to go. It will, it will take you to places where you're, you're asked to confront or deal with uh, dimensions of your life that you didn't know were there. It may be a summons to something that asks for more courage than you would want to have to bring to the table. Or it may reveal dimensions of your shadow, and we realize we're not quite the virtuous person we'd like to think we are. So um, it's, it's essentially a kind of therapy of meaning, if you will. doesn't mean we ignore the practical dimensions of daily life, you know, marriages and career choices and dealing with children and all of those sorts of things. And it doesn't mean that we, we you know, steer clear of the usual range of psychopathology, because again, a psychopathology, if you understand its roots, is literally translated as an expression of the suffering of the soul. That's what the word psychopathology means. But again, um, modern psychology, by and large, has rid itself of the idea of psyche in, uh, in, in, in sort of service to these behavioral and cognitive modifications, which have practical implications, yes, but don't ever really speak to our depths and don't really, I think, lead to transformation. Well, I, you know, when I think about how I have a sense of my own psyche, it's really through my dreams. Mm -hmm. Um, There are certainly other, you know, other things that speak to me, but dreams are so essential. And of course, Mm -hmm. uh, Carl Jung built much of his theories on it. So here's the thing I wonder about. 60 million Americans go with less than four hours of sleep a night, Mm -hmm. which means they're probably not going into a dream state. Well, they probably are. Oh, you think so? Maybe concentrated. Uh, Sleep research tells us we average six dreams per night. And of course, most people say, well, I don't, or I never remember them. Well, that may be true. But um, it's, it's also true that, as I said, lab studies have indicated about that many sleeps, or dreams, rather. So I could imagine that that's concentrated in those four hours. On the other hand, we know when there's been, uh, you know, sleep medication or alcohol or something like that, a person is often pushed into a deeper trough. And it's not in that area of brain activity that, where the dreaming occurs. You know, it's in the upper range of brain activity. So those people who have been in sleep research studies that were allowed to sleep, but not allowed to dream, they'd be awakened the moment they start dreaming, then they can go back to sleep, found after a number of days of this that they began to have experiences not unlike hallucination. It's almost as if that whatever the material was, was demanding somehow to be addressed, somehow be processed. And so, it, it, again, says so something about the psyche as a self-regulating system. You know, our, our inherent condition is self-regulatory. That's why, from a depth psychological standpoint, we, we don't try to say how quickly do we fix, you know, whether the symptoms are. We'd rather ask the question, why have they come? Why are they asking of us, you know, some, some further attention? I'll give you a quick example. When I was in my early 30s, I had achieved all the goals that I thought were important for my life. And I was, I was happy with them. At the same time, I began to experience a serious depression. That's what took me to my first hour of analysis many moons ago. I didn't think at that time I was starting a different kind of journey in the second half of life. I was just wanting to sort of deal with a depression. But uh, then, then I began to realize, all right. Depression is something pressed down. What is it that's pressed down? Or the way I would put it today is, why is your psyche autonomously withdrawn its approval and support from the agenda that the executive suite upstairs, there at the top of the Sears Tower, are sending down as messages to us, you know? I mean, for example, you know, try to imagine you're going to dream of what, hamburgers tonight or, or the Chicago White Sox or something like that. Your psyche's not going to pay any attention to you. It has its own life. It has its own autonomy. It's going to speak of what it wishes to speak of. 
And then it behooves us to say, well, what is trying to communicate with you here? So ra again, rather than sort of say, how quickly do we fix this problem? We, we ask, what does it really mean for me? Maybe it's, I'm, I'm fond of saying that depth psychology always asks the question, what is it about really? Or it's not about what it's about. So the question then is you have to ask, what is this really about? And that's when you begin to enter that uh, deep in dialogue. Now, admittedly, not everybody can be in, in depth uh, psychotherapy or psychoanalysis, and, and nor should they. But at the same time, you have to say, all right, then if that kind of reflection, that kind of consideration is neglected, what happens to a person? Where does that energy go? Where do those symptoms show up in their children, in their marriages, uh, in their unconscious behaviors? Because we have to say, Whatever I'm not addressing is still spilling into the world through me, whether I pay attention to it or not. So this business of the in-between time that you described mm -hmm. in your 30s where you, you know, yeah. you, you really took a, a change in your life. Yeah. You had been up until then a, a professor, correct? That's correct. This in-between time, it seems to me, uh, is is what and based on you know reading your book, one of the things it calls us to do is maybe what Jung said about facing fear. And well, actually, he said only boldness can deliver us from fear. And if the risk is not taken, the meaning of life is somehow violated, and the whole future is condemned to hopeless staleness. Mm -hmm. Is that where the collective is right now? I mean, you titled this book "In Between Times." Yeah. Are we fa are we struggling to face fears that we need to face? Well, of course, and and one of those fears is this is the first time since World War II where a a social issue has reached directly into every household in North America and threatened each of us because the the virus, is, as you know, is, is not particular and, and has no prejudice. It simply shows up wherever it's going to show up. So, you know, Jung's point there is, I think, critical. Uh, it's going to sound terribly reductionistic on my part, but you can't underestimate the power of our fear management systems. And we need to understand they're there for good reasons. We learn how to cope with life, how to protect ourselves in our fragility and our vulnerability. That's true. The thing that I learned in Zurich in several years of analysis was astonishing to me and continues to be. But essentially was this, what you have become, which is to say the assemblage of behaviors, attitudes, and reflexive defenses in this world is now your chief problem. And, and therefore, you can see why, as Freud pointed out so, so well over a century ago, the enormous resistance that we all feel to change the self-examination, because it means, as you just suggested, we will have to face our fears. We will have to start dealing with that which does not wish to be dealt with. And so when we do that, we, we then have to take on a larger responsibility, a larger accountability to our souls. One of the ways I put this is in the first half of life, your agenda is essentially a social one. We have to develop enough ego strength to cope with our parents, to uh, you know, deal with playmates on the, on the school ground, step out into the world, begin to form friendships, relationships, careers, et cetera, et cetera. But then having done that, why are we still here after you know, maybe reproducing the species or played our, a social role? Then you begin to realize something inside has been agitating, but it begins to agitate with greater fervor that is soliciting a different kind of dialogue. And, and it's at that point, and Jung pointed this out in an essay many, many decades ago called The Two Stages of Life, where the dialogue has to be between the ego world and, and the world of the psyche. And, and that is the richest conversation we will ever have and it directly affects the quality of all of our conversations with people otherwise. There's a, a, you know, an inescapable fact of all relationships is they can be no more evolved um, with the other than I've evolved in relationship to myself. 
And while that sounds simplistic and, and a, a kind of truism, the implications of that are, are profound because it means the best thing I can do for others is work on that sort of conversation with what's really going on inside of me. Because where I'm blind or stupid or <laughs> fearful and, and blocked is still happening in the world still is burdening my children or, or showing up with the employees or something like that. So this is the ultimate form of social accountability, ironically. That's why this is not a narcissistic preoccupation. It's affecting the quality of all of our engagements with the exterior world. Well, I, as I think about your, your answer, which was very detailed, thank you, I, I also wonder about that external world that the individual faces that really has, I think the message has been that it's smart to be fearful. If you're not fearful, you're naive. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder what you would say to that. Like, how is that, how are you seeing that kind of embrace that cultural embrace of fear Mm -hmm. um, showing up in your work as an analyst? Well, first of all, fear is not the problem. Um, Fear is a a natural attribute of the animal that we are. If I had no fear, I'd just walk in front of the car or I would approach the tiger. Uh, Fear is is protective. The issue, though, is the degree of autonomy that it begins to assume in our life. That's why I said you'd be shocked if you really track so many of our adaptive behaviors into the underground, you realize they're fear-based responses. Now, fear is not the problem. (laughs) The real pragmatic question is, what does that fear make me do? Or what is that fear keeping me from doing with my life? And that, I say, is a pragmatic question because that shows up in our relationships, our careers, our, you know, life strategies and, and so forth. So, you know, as I put it in a book called The Middle Passage many years ago, we waken every morning with two gremlins at the foot of the bed. One is called fear that says, you know, it's too much for you out there. You can't handle it. Better, better play it safe. And the other is lethargy, that internal ener- energy within us that is regressive, that wants to avoid conflict, wants to avoid showing up, wants to avoid rigor. And, and they're the enemies of life. And every day, no matter what we did yesterday, they show up today and they'll be there tomorrow morning. So fear and lethargy are intrapsychic. Now, of course, there are cultural forms that, that trigger these fears, as we well know. And we're, we are, as historic creatures, a, a series of res- reflexive responses to those fears. That's what complexes are, after all. So whenever I'm in the grip of a complex, I'm literally pulled out of this moment and thrust into the time and place and general powerlessness that the complex uh, uh, had when it was uh, generated. So again, becoming aware of these clusters of energy that we have that were necessary because history happens, adaptation is obliged. Um, and at the same time, realize there's a shadow government inside of each of us that is playing out its role time and time and time again. And that's why the psyche has to show up and say, say in so many words, we are not amused here. You know, we down here, metaphorically, are not amused with how things are going upstairs. And we're going to uh, engage in a work stoppage, let's say, or we're going to sabotage your well-being until such time as you stop and pay attention to it. So you talked about in the book and, and really throughout this, this interview, you've mentioned things about, you know, coming alive and being in alignment with the uh, psyche and the needs of the psyche, what about, what about your own life? I, I was reading, you know, 16 books, and I believe you have another one in the works, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you, you lecture widely. Um, you, uh, you play roles in various Jungian institutions, and you run a thriving anal- analysis um, practice. So mm-hmm. what drives Jim Hollis? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I think there are two answers to it. There's always pathology. And remember, when I use the word pathology, it's not a judgment. 
I, I grew up about 200 miles south of um, Chicago in Springfield, Illinois. My parents were uh, children of uh, impoverishment and of the Great Depression, and they had a very, very tough life. And I realized as a child, though I could do nothing about it, that their life was governed by fear and adaptation and, and the necessities of survival. So I got from them a very strong work ethic, but I also realized that I, I had to somehow find some other resources that would help me escape from all of that, or at least not be defined by it. And, and fortunately, there was something called public education. And so I, I began to revere my teachers who began to teach me things about the world. So all of my life, I think the one thread that's always been there is teaching. Either I was a student being taught, and I still am, or I was a teacher. And, and so um, for me, teaching has been, and sometimes it's through books, sometimes it's through public speaking, sometimes it's in analysis. Um, most of all, hopefully it can be as we embody ourselves in this world. Um, teaching is my vocation. And... Um, as a result of that, I, I've continued to enjoy learning and I've continued to feel that I'm growing and new challenges. I'm still, as long as you're curious, you know, you're fully alive. And um, I mentioned I'm 80 now, so there are huge changes in the body, of course. That's, that's where we know where this is headed, by the way. At the same time, as long as there's curiosity, you're, you're alive and, and functioning and um, involved in an, in an engaged way. As Yeats put it once, uh, soul sing, clap hands, and louder sing for every tatter in the mortal dress. Well, the mortal dress is tattered, I can tell you, at 80, but the uh, soul is alive and well. So you've, you talked about education, and you yourself have led training programs mm -hmm. for uh, analysts. And so it makes me want to ask you about that work and what makes, you know, in the training, in the grooming of, of an analyst, are there traits that make for good, at, good analysis? Is, is there something that you can typically see in someone that lets you know this person is really meant for this work? That's a very good question because it's clear that technical competence or intelligence itself, while helpful, can actually stand in the way. Uh, most of all is something that's very intangible, and that is a uh, somehow a willingness to pay attention to what's going on inside and, and to take it seriously, not to literalize it, but to, to work with it, to engage in that conversation. And um, that, that person somehow who is going to go on in this work is, is going to be challenged so many ways. Um, you know, it was Emerson said once, uh, who you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. And I think in, in the end, the um, real issue is very, very non-tangible. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can sense that in people. And, and sometimes you realize they're very fine people, qualified people, but they really need to be doing something else. And then there's another whole category of people who are there for understandable, but probably the wrong reasons. And that's because life trauma has pushed them there when their real calling may have been to be a tree surgeon or a country and Western singer or a truck driver. And so um, this, this work is not necessarily for everyone. I have an essay in the new book uh, called the, uh, the profile or the archetype of the wounded healer. And we're all wounded healers, and whether we know it or not, but some people feel a special calling to address that. And what they really need to do is, is heal themselves first and, um, you know, then go, go be free to live their lives. And so I would say in general, and I, I don't mean this in any sort of statistical way, but maybe half of the people in the helping professions, and I include you know, teachers, social workers, clerics, physicians, everybody, you know, should be there. And half are being pushed out of their history to be there. And, and they are often sort of twice victimized, once by that history and once by their continuing to be defined by that. 
there are so many bits of wisdom in the book about resilience. And as you were answering that question, I was thinking about, wow, what, what kind of resilience it takes to be a, an analyst. But then I guess it's, it takes a lot of resilience to be an, an, an analysis. But if you were to stand back and really say, say, you know, if there is one overarching thing, that someone can do to put themselves in congruence with the psyche mm-hmm. to be resilient, what would that be? Well, I want to say two things. First of all, resilience is implicit and implicate in our nature. We may or may not know that, but we do have to ask this question. Why would you say that you are not equipped by nature or divinity, if you prefer that metaphor, um, to live this journey. It's in our DNA. We don't know that until sometimes life asks that of us. So I think that's issue number one. Um, Number two is people have to ask some very basic questions. Well, for example, um, people have often said, well, how do I start this process? And I, I would say, well, you start with your patterns. You don't rise in the morning and say, well, today I'm going to do the same stupid counterproductive things I've done for a decade. But, you know, by and large, we will. So you have to say, all right, wheresoever there is a pattern, thereunto, in the unconscious, particularly those things that we find counterproductive. So why would we do it deliberately? But there it is. You have to say, all right, there's a cluster of energy that's operating autonomously. So I need to work back from the, see, the problem with the unconscious is we can't describe the unconscious. We can't talk about it. But when it manifests in a pattern, then you've got a clue. What kind of, quote, idea or story or charge cluster of energy uh, could give rise to this pattern in your life? Because what we do is logical based on what has been triggered intrapsychically. And that's how you begin to sort of see those autonomous elements within that shadow government to which I referred earlier. And and then you begin to say of every behavior or pattern or issue, why did I react that way? What gave it that much energy? Um, Or of a a decision, let's say, where did that come from in me? We are historic creatures. That's the good news because we can build on our experience and and learn not to touch that hot iron or walk in front of a car. But the bad news is that history also, having a certain degree of autonomy, continuously imposes itself on new situations. That's why we get stuck, we get caught in old behaviors, or we find ourselves constantly being, you know, in in the same old place. And it's because of the autonomy of that history. So part of what this process is about is interrogating that history. Where is this coming from, from in me? What is this touch in my history? There's, there's the new moment in life is always new and unique, but we help adapt ourselves to it by reframing it in terms of our life's analogs or life experiences. But again, that, that can lead to repetition and stuckness and, and depression and, and so forth. So basically, I, I think each of us has to assume, this sounds so simple, but it's not really. You have to assume accountability for your own life. And to invoke the old cliche, on your deathbed, when you look back, will you be able to say, you know, with all the stupidities and mistakes in life that are unavoidable, was I here? Did it matter? Did I from time to time stand up against that fear? Did I show up in the best way I could as, 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 as myself and not just an adaptive, uh, reflexive response? And, and did I at some level help embody what wanted to end the world through me? Because, again, the agenda of the first half of life is what does the world want of me and how do I meet those demands and expectations? Second half of life is what wants to enter the world through me? And, and that's why, you know, I continue to be a teacher and a writer and, and, and so forth. 
There are times I'd like to forget it all and turn on the television and watch a ball game. But, you know, maybe there's there's a book that's nudging there. And so at the end of a long work day, I, I sit down and I write, for example, typically. And and again, the byproduct of that, the payoff, is it's experienced meaningfully. That's the key. Rather than simply living a life that's a fugitive life or life from one passing fad to another. So this accountability and to our own soul, again, is not self-absorption. It's, it's how we, in some way, serve that which is larger than we. You can point it out so many times. People need a story larger than the one their ego world creates for them. So if we say, my job in this world is to be successful, well, how, how defined? Well, defined in these ways by this particular culture. So let's say I try to do that in good faith and I achieve those uh, points of reference and yet inwardly it feels empty. What am I going to do with that? You know, where am I to go from there? And that's, that's why so many people are absent spirited, you know, because they've done in good faith what they were supposed to do. And yet, you know, their psyche has not in the long run cooperated which is why the, the work of responding to the psyche is, is humbling because we have to go back to the drawing board. We have to say, all right, here's something I don't know about myself or here's something I'm being called to do. Um, I can't tell you how many times people have said through the years, I, I always wanted to, and then there's a but in the sentence, you know, dot, 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 you fill it in. I always wanted to go do this. I always wanted to learn to play the piano. I always wanted to learn Italian, whatever it is. There's always an excuse for not doing it. I didn't have the money. The children needed me here and there, et cetera, et cetera. All of which may be true. And at the end of the journey, we're still accountable. So there it is. And, you know, many times people have said, do you think I should do this or that? And I would say, yes. You know, try to find as much opportunity. If you have to, sacrifice something. Sac- something important to you, such as some sleep or, or some leisure activity. To see that that part of you is honored. Because therein you serve nature. If you serve it, it will, it will serve you. So I listened to one of your lectures on um, the journey of individuation. You know, the coming into the sense of wholeness. Mm-hmm. And... Again, you sort of mentioned that every passage in life, there's this leaving behind of something, there's a growing towards something, and then there's that in-between time. I think the book addresses the in-between time, and you have another book that does that about midlife. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you see, if we're in the in-between time as a collective, Mm -hmm. do you have any sense of what we're going toward? I, I think anyone who really speculates on that is whistling Dixie here. I, we, don't <laughs> we really don't know. Uh, just as and people sometimes in analysis um, actually have to endure years of the in-between time. We would like to think, well, it's 30 days to this or that, five easy steps, bang, bang, bang. That's what pop culture you know, advertises. And if it worked, we would know it by now. You have to hang on. You go through it by going through it. And we're in an in-between time. There are tendencies in our culture that are disturbing, as, as we all know. And, and one of which is um, addressed by the increased use of artificial intelligence. We, we're using those tools right now to the benefit of our educational purposes here. So I'm not against technology. I'm simply saying, uh, increasingly, as we all know, our, our lives are being governed by that technology. Our privacy is eroded and our world becomes more and more sort of open and available to, to others. I, I think there are many disturbing trends in the culture. And, and with all of the material advantages that it brings us, you know, what's the price of that? What's the price? There's an amusing story that um, once, you know, Freud's uh, daughter Anna had gone to London and was living there and he got a letter from his daughter and he said to a friend imagine she's in London and I got this letter from her in only three days 
Then he thought for a moment and he said, but of course, um, if, if this weren't the modern era, I could walk in the other room and talk to her. So it's, it's certainly true that um, we all have profited from this technological achievement. But, you know, as Dostoevsky pointed out in um, Notes from Underground, which was published about 1863, he said, you know, we're congratulating ourselves at the great, you know, first international exhibit at um, the Crystal Palace outside of London. And he said, I imagine in the next century, people will use that same technology to kill many more people far more efficiently. And, and he, who was right, you know, Dostoevsky or all the apostles of progress. Right. Well, that seems a good place to end. Jim, this has been an absolute delight. And uh, I'd like to put our marker down for coming back to you when your next book is out. When do you expect that? Uh, I believe it's mid-February, yeah, uh, reflections on uh, this journey we call life. And um, it's 11 essays on different subjects. Include, and one of the essays is on reframing our sense of self and world during the pandemic. And that one was written recently, meaning about, um, I guess, August of this, this, this year. And um, one was on the wounded healer, and one's on aging, and, and one's on desire, and, uh, various subjects. So I'd be happy to come back and talk to you again, Patricia. It's been a pleasant time to, to, to share with you. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.youngchicago.org. Thank you to the 2020 donors who gave at the supporting member level and above. Barbara Anand, Usha and Ashok Beatty, Jackie K. Bryan, Eric Cooper, Judith Cooper, Kevin Davis, George J. Didier, James Fidelibus, John Korolewski, Marty Manning, Diane Sherwood, Deborah P. Stutzman, Deborah Tobin, Alexander Wayne and Lynn Cobb, Gerald Weiner, Karen West, and James Taylor, and Ellen Young. And thank you to everybody else who gave at that level but wishes to remain anonymous. 